<laughs> you just did great. Well, we are, if you have a Bible, open it up to Habakkuk. We're going to be in Habakkuk today. And we're in our series called Messengers. And the reason we called it Messengers is because really the point isn't Habakkuk. It's this message from God. And I really believe, and if you don't have a Bible, uh, you can raise your hand. Someone will give you a Bible. We're going to put the text on the screen for you this morning as well. But the reason we called it Messengers is because I believe that here's what God was trying to do. He was trying to get a message across to his people, to his covenant people, the chosen people. And they just weren't listening. And he was trying to have this relationship with them, and they just weren't having it. So he sent messenger after messenger after messenger to say, hey, you're getting this wrong, and you're making a mess, and it's going to end really badly for you. Um, and so the reason we called it messenger instead of the minor prophets, because it's, it's, it's a better picture of really what we want to know and believe and behave as a church. If you're here today, I believe God has a message for you. I don't believe it's an accident that you're here or that you're tuning in online. Like, I think there's a message that God desperately wants you to know from him. And then I think it's also true for us that, you know, Habakkuk, Malachi, Hosea, they're all messengers, but we are called in the New Testament to go and make disciples. We're called to take the message of the gospel out. So let that be a reminder, what we called it, messengers, that we would receive the message from God and we would carry that message, that we would also become messengers. Today is going to be, I don't, do you guys have a favorite sitcom, right? Think back to like the 80s. What were some of your favorite sitcoms? Different Strokes, maybe, Cheers, Three's Company. How, I was not allowed to watch that. So, like, it, yeah, it was not, like, had to kind of sneak it. Not really, Mom, I didn't sneak it. But, like, there are sitcoms. And here, here's the idea behind a sitcom, right? That it's about 30 minutes or a little bit less than 30 minutes. There's kind of some fun. There's uh, some conflict. And then that conflict gets neatly resolved within like 22 and a half minutes. And there's maybe a, a, like a, a light moral to the story, but everybody kind of feels good at the end of it. And you kind of turn it off like, hey, that, that was great. Habakkuk is not one of those. It's just not. And so if, if you're here today, I really don't believe it's an accident that you're here today. When I look at Habakkuk, I think it's one of the most honest, authentic of all of the minor prophets. It's really unique. Like most of the minor prophets that we've been looking at, um, God would tell the prophet to take a message to his people and speak on his behalf. Habakkuk, or some of you might say it, Habakkuk, you're wrong, it's Habakkuk. No, I don't know what's right. I never, didn't know the dude. But like, it's the only interaction that we see where it's really exclusively the prophet and God. And Habakkuk comes to God and he's, he's really struggling Like, here's a guy who's righteous, he's a good dude, he's been loving and standing up for the truths of God, and then Habakkuk has this amazing, honest conversation with God, and quite frankly, Habakkuk's just ready to throw in the towel. His faith in God, his belief that God is good, that God listens, that God cares, that he's interested, that he is just, all those things are kind of on shaky ground for, Habak- for Habakkuk. And so I, th- I was thinking about people in my life this week. Myself, like every single person here, has experienced disappointment in your life. In a, in a group of this size, like every person has some, some sense of disappointment. You didn't get the promotion you wanted. Like you didn't get the grade that you wanted. The girl that you asked out, like she wants nothing to do with you. And like that's the fifth girl you asked, right? And it's just not going well. You're just kind of disappointed that life hasn't really turned out for you the way you wanted it to. But for a lot of you in this room, and I I know your stories, and I prayed for a lot of you this week as I was preparing the sermon, a lot of you, it's much, much deeper than disappointment. It's like despair, right? You have gone through deep, deep loss in your life, and you might be going through that deep, deep loss and despair right now. Some of you have been through it, it might be years ago. For some of you, I know that are here, went through the most traumatic thing that anyone could ever go through. And and it was years ago, but it still hurts today. And it still rears its ugly head. And like, there's days where you question that God is fair, does God care? For others of you, like, you've been trying to get pregnant for like six, seven years, and it's not happening, and you know that there are girls out there that are getting pregnant, not wanting to be pregnant, having abortion after abortion after abortion. Like, God, how does that make any sense? 
How are you blessing them and they're just throwing away the opportunity and yet you don't see fit to make me a mom or a dad? Others of you, like my, my good friends, um, they lost a baby this summer. I, they went right up to the, the, the week the week that the baby was to be delivered, right? So it wasn't like a first trimester. It was uh, Sunday, everything was going good. Monday, things weren't. Due date was Thursday. I did the funeral. And how in those moments are we able to describe to someone the goodness of God, the justice of God, Others of you have experienced deep, deep consequence from someone else's sin. Someone has hurt you, someone has abused you, they've mistreated you, your marriage fell apart this year or the last couple years, and really, like, you did everything you possibly could, and this person just walked away, and now you're left with the consequences of just this terrible, terrible thing, like... Where's the fairness in that? Well, that, that's what Habakkuk was struggling with. So there's a couple things we're going to look at today. Does God care? If your circumstances don't play out the way that you want them to play out, is God unloving? Does he listen? Does he even care about injustice that's happening around the world or in your life? And then what do we do with that? What are the dangers in how we question God? So we're going to jump in with Habakkuk. We're going to learn from Habakkuk. And then after that, I want to take you briefly to the New Testament. Because sometimes we can go to these Old Testament minor prophets and say, well, that was then. That was Israel. Those principles are not repeated in the New Testament. I want to make that really clear for you today. The principles we're going to learn today are as true for you and I as they were for Habakkuk. We're not Israel, but it was written for us. And we are God's covenant people today. So let's jump in. Habakkuk 1. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. Let's go ahead, Matt, sorry. (laughs) This is his uh, scream to God. Like the silence of God causes him to cry out. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? I cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate injustice? wrongdoings. Destruction and violence are before me. Their strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law or your word is paralyzed. It has no active ability. It's paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous. So that, that picture there is that the righteous that there are still in, in the people of God, this would be Habakkuk included, that there's unrighteous people all around them and there's no way out. Like they are hemmed in by the unrighteous so that justice is perverted. I think verse five, that was it. Okay, so here, here's a, are you back there, Matt? Okay, here's, what, here's the, the situation. It's kind of hard to understand kind of, well, what is that even about? Well, if you understand the context of the minor prophets, um, God wanted his children of Israel to be his children. They did not want um, to follow God the way that he wanted them to. He said, hey, I don't want you to have a king. I want to be your king. He's like, well, we want a king. And so God said, okay, but this is how the kings are going to treat you. And it's not going to be what you think it is. Like, we don't care. We look at everybody else. We want a king just like them. So they got a king, and, and it was Saul, and then it was David, and then Solomon. And after Solomon, it went really bad. The kingdom divided, and there was a northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, and wicked king after wicked king. If you want to go back and, and look at our study that we did, uh, Lessons from a King, we, we go through that, those kings uh, many, many weeks in there. And it, was, it wasn't it was just a sad story. Wicked king after wicked king, and it brought wicked wickedness and idolatry and just evil in the people of God. And they were not following God. During that same time, God is sending these prophets, these messengers saying, hey, this is not what I have for you. And they didn't listen. Some of the prophets they killed, none of the prophets they listened to. Every now and then there would be a king and there would be revival, um, but that was few and far between. For the most part, Habakkuk's cry here is about The people of Judah, the northern kingdom has already been taken off into slavery. God has already judged them. The southern kingdom, Judah, did not learn from that lesson. And now they are continuing to go down this path of evil, of violence, of injustice. And Habakkuk is a righteous person living among them. And he's like, God, 
How are you allowing this to happen? Why are you being so patient with the sinners in the covenant people of God? And Habakkuk is just like, God, I don't see you. Like, I know that you say that you're righteous, but I don't see you. You're making me wait. You're making me suffer at the, uh, at, at, in, in this culture. Like, my people, I need you to do something because it's not working. And then we jump into uh, God's response. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if I told you. So he's going to say, okay. I will act. I know you feel like I'm not going to. Here's what I'm going to do. Look at the nation. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth and seize dwellings not their own. So what he's saying here is that he's going to use, we're going to see this in Hezekiah's response. He's going to rise up the Babylonians and he's going to conquer Judah. Um, God's patience is running out. And we think Habakkuk's written maybe 605 B.C. That's when the Babylonians first came in. There were three waves of judgment for Judah. They came in in 605 B.C. and then a few years later. And so it was probably written before that. It hasn't actually happened yet. And God unveils his plan to Habakkuk and say, hey, no, I'm here. I'm super offended by what's going on. I know it's not working. It's been 500 years of me trying to get their, their attention like this isn't working. This is drastic. You would not believe it, even if I told you, here it is, I'm sending the Babylonians to bring in judgment. Well, Hezekiah, or sorry, Habakkuk doesn't really like that plan. This is his response to God. This is his second round of complaints in uh, chapter 1, verse 12. Lord, are you not Are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? He's talking about the Babylonians. Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Do you see his complaint here? He's like, God, I know that you're going to bring justice. Um, Thank you for that. Thank you for noticing. I don't like your plan at all. Like, there has to be a better way to do this. And his biggest complaint here, you see him questioning God. Like, God, okay, I believe in my heart that you are righteous, I believe that you cannot tolerate evil, so why are you going to use a people group that's even more evil than your covenant people to judge them? Like, it didn't make any sense to Habakkuk at all. And so God responds to him. Then the Lord replied, this is chapter 2, verse 2, then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on the tablet so that a herald may run with it. What he's saying is like, hey, this, this is going to happen. Like, make it be really clear. Make sure everybody knows. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of an end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. We're going to stop right there, Matt. So what he's saying here is like, hey, um, I know that you think this evil people that I'm going to use um, like they're just going to get away with it. That's what, that's what Habakkuk is really upset about. Hey, I want you to do something about Judah. Would you please? It is out of control. It's been out of control for 500 years, but there has to be another way. Like you're going to use a people that's even more evil than your covenant people to take them off into captivity, to destroy their, their houses and all those things. Like that doesn't make sense to me, God. And then they just get away with it. I I thought you judged evil. I thought you were a righteous. I thought you were a holy God. I thought that I could trust you. And what he's saying here is like, uh, I will judge them. And if you you have time, I encourage you to go and study it. We don't have time today. But verses five through the rest of the chapter, he goes through the five woes to the Babylonians. Like Habakkuk, make, make no mistake. I know this about them. 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 And they are a horrible people. They're everything that you said they are. I see it. I'm not missing it. And I will hold them accountable. I think verse three is really an interesting one because it, it, it plays into where we are today, right? So from Habakkuk's perspective, God was not just. From the seat that he had, 
God was not just twice in this conversation. Number one, you're not judging like the evil within your covenant people, Judah. But number two, your plan to bring justice makes no sense. Like no sense, God. I thought you were a, a kind and loving and just God. Like how is this loving? How is this just? And God is saying, hey, you're, they're not going to get away with it. I will judge them. And we're going to get to that in a second. But um, I asked my friend Judine Gardner to, to kind of illustrate this with some photos. So I'm going to put a couple photos up here. Matt, put the first one up there. What do you guys think this is? A flower? Yeah, what else? What? Hummingbird. There, you got it. So now let's zoom out a little bit. And you can see the beautiful picture. Judine took this in her backyard. She's a super talented artist. But when you're, when you're zoomed in super close, it's really hard to like actually understand what it is. You zoom out a little bit, you can see a little bit bigger picture. The next one's a little more difficult. What do you think we got going here? What do you see in this picture? What? Hey, it's a dock. So what would the blue be? A dog? No, it's not a dog. That's an ugly dog, dude. That is not a dog. It is a dock. And the blue, if you zoom out, what you're going to see is this is actually a picture from Glacier Park, which she took. And so when you zoom out a little bit, the picture becomes, oh, okay, that makes sense. I think that was Habakkuk's, like, position. He was so close to it. All he saw was the pain and suffering he was going through and then the pain and suffering that they were about to go through. And it just didn't make sense. And what, he, what God was going to say to him was like, Listen, it's going to make sense. Not right now. And it's not going to be on your timetable, but it will make sense someday. We have one more photo. Can you throw that one up there, Matt? What do you guys think is going on here? What? Tricks. My favorite cereal, by the way. My favorite, you silly rabbit. Tricks are for kids, right? So this is my favorite cereal. I even got a t-shirt. So if you zoom out, this is actually a t-shirt. It shows you, like... I've had that, t I lost it somewhere. So if you want to bless your pastor, you can buy me a Trix t-shirt. <laughs> this is like 20 years ago. It shows you how long Josue and I have been friends. That's actually Jacob that I'm holding there. Jake is like 6'5", 225 now. That's Josh and that's Maria Villatoro asleep. She's got bad hair. But if you zoom in, this is also proof. Can you zoom in for it? That Josue <laughs> actually had hair at some point in our relationship and he came to Calvary and he's sitting back there like it's all gone <laughs> I'm so sorry the church has been rough on you this way <laughs> so let, let's continue on in chapter two let's see how uh, so if, if you want to read those verses on your own he goes woe after woe after woe I see the evil that you're describing Habakkuk I see it like I'm more aware of it than you are I'm holier than you are and look look what he says in I think verse 14 for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So that might sound like an innocent verse if you just kind of pull it out of context and read it. Like, oh, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord like the water covers the sea, right? That's a verse of judgment. That is a verse of judgment like, like it will be impossible for evil to escape the judgment of God. The knowledge and the glory and the goodness and the justice of God will not let injustice, evil, go unjudged. That's why Judah is going to be judged. And that is why the Babylonians one day will be completely destroyed. And, and that does happen. Not that long after. Um, if you go to the verse 20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. In the context of, these verse, of, the context of chapter 2, both of these verses have everything to do with God will make right that which was made wrong. That's the context. And, and so that, that is God's response to Habakkuk's questions. Now, there's a couple things I think that are really important to notice here. Never in these chapters, in these, these two chapters of dialogue between Habakkuk and God, does God say, Habakkuk, how dare you question me? How dare, who do you think you are? And I think there is a point, like, you could, you could question God in a way that God would respond. But I think there's, a, there's a, an interesting um, element to the questioning of Habakkuk. Like, it's an honest question, right? It's an honest doubt. He, he comes to this place like, God, I, I thought you were good. Like, I want to believe that you're good. But, like, 
I don't understand this. Where are you? You're not listening. I feel abandoned by you. I want to believe that you're everlasting, that you will judge right and wrong, but how are you using the Babylonians? And it's just super confusing to him. But I actually believe that God is a friend to the honest doubter. If you're here today and you are struggling because whatever circumstance you're going through, like it's just rocking your world and you are struggling today to believe that God is good because of the circumstances that have gone on in your life and you ask yourself like, God, where, where are you honestly, God? Like I read in your word that you love me. I don't feel that today. And I don't feel that on the anniversary of this event every year. I want to, but I just can't. I think that's a very honest kind of doubt. And I believe that God is the friend to the honest questioner. Questioning God in an honest way, like, hey, God, this doesn't make sense. I've never seen God be angry, upset with anybody in the Bible that, that questions that way. I do believe there is a dishonest questioning of God. That you've already made up your mind who God is and you're trying to disprove, discredit, and, and get yourself to a place where you are off the hook. That you don't have to reckon with God as an amazing God, as the judge over all. And you just want to let yourself off the hook. So, you know, God, there can't be a God because this happened. If you dig a little deeper, I think that's actually like you're just trying to let yourself off the hook. But if you honestly are searching for the truth and you're honestly struggling through um, deep, deep trauma in your life, deep pain in your life, I believe that God is a friend to that questioner. He, he enters into this with Habakkuk and reassures Habakkuk in such a way that it causes Habakkuk to respond um, in an amazing way. Chapter three is a song. And if we go to chapter three, verse one, this is Habakkuk's it's really interesting because it's almost like there's a psalm stuck in the end of this prophecy uh, because Habakkuk's honest questioning and his interaction that he has with God and God reassuring him that, okay, I will judge and one day I will restore, but this is not working, so I will bring judgment on Judah, but not forever, and I will bring Judah back. We know that's a part of the story. Um, he will restore. So a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigianoth. Anybody know what Shigianoth means? Yeah, nobody does. <laughs> You're right. Nobody does. We, it probably has something to do with music, but we don't know for sure. Uh, I just like to be honest with you when I can. Um, but go to verse 2. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. So what he's saying is like, hey, I know, like I've heard of who you are. I know that, that you're supposed to be this God. Would you repeat those things in my day? And then he knows that God is going to judge him, judge all of Judah. It's like, in your wrath, will you remember mercy? Will you bring judgment? And, and like, I'm going to trust that your way is the right way. But would you not forget mercy? Like, he's not saying, hey, we deserve it. He's saying, we actually don't deserve your mercy, but I know that you're a merciful God. And he spends the next, like, 15 verses up to verse 15, and he just goes through this, like, piles on all these things that he knows that are true of God. I think it's an incredible spiritual discipline that Habakkuk goes through here right now. He's like, okay, my heart is in a really, really, really bad place right now. Like, I, I am struggling to believe that God is good. I'm struggling to believe that he cares. I'm struggling to believe that his plan is the best plan because it's a painful plan. And I don't see these circumstances changing. And so he does this spiritual discipline of just writing down all the good things that he knows that are true of God. He goes back to how God rescued them from slavery. He goes back to how he conquered like the Cushites and the Midianites when they came in. He talks about how he takes their own arrows and pierces their, the warrior's head of the enemy. It's, it's amazing. And it only makes sense if you go back and you read that he's doing this spiritual discipline of remembering He's doing this spiritual discipline of, okay, my heart is not in a good place, but what do I know to be true? You ever like get to those decision points where like you have a really difficult decision that makes you make a pro and con list? Like I just got to clear my head because I can't get it straight. So let me write it down. I think that's what he's doing here. He's writing down everything he knows to be true of God and God's goodness and provision in the past because right now he doesn't feel it. And I think that's true for you and I. Like if you're here today and you are struggling because 
of something that's happened in the past or maybe there's circumstances you're in right now that are causing you to just like, I'm like really honestly at the point of walking away from this because I want to believe that God is good, but my life, my circumstance, and my heart right now is really struggling to believe that. I think there's an incredible spiritual discipline you can do. Write down the ways and specific ways that you know that God has been good to you. If you have your health, write down your health. If you have a wife and kids, write, write your wife and kids down. If you have a job, if you have a roof over your head, if you don't have to go and work in the field with a hoe every single day and drink water from a hole in the ground and have uh, uh, bugs living inside your stomach, okay, I have actually decent health care. To make a list of the ways that God has blessed you. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. That's what Habakkuk is doing here. And, and then I think the three most beautiful verses in the entire book of Habakkuk we come to after he lists the spiritual disciplines of God is good, this is who he is. Look what he says. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decray kept into my bones and my legs trembled. Isn't that amazing imagery? Do you know what he's writing about? He's writing about, whew, the circumstances that I'm currently in and the circumstances that are about to happen give me great fear. I am not settled with it. I don't like it. I don't want it. And, and I, I think that there's some honesty here. And I think in the church, sometimes we tend to trivialize the, the valleys, right? And, and we try to give these, these Christian pat answers. Hey, you know what? That's okay. God's got something better for you. Or he doesn't. And it's about to, like, it, it gets darkest just before it goes, like, lights out. Right. No, I'm not kidding. But, like, there is no promise in Scripture that God is going to bless you 100% of the time. There is no promise in Scripture that in this life you will just experience joy and happiness and you will never struggle. In fact, we find the opposite. And, and even Jesus, when you look at his life, he came and he was falsely accused it was a sham of a court case. Um, he was beaten beyond recognition, and then he was pushed on a cross, and he was killed uh, for a crime he did not commit for you and for me. Like, that wasn't an enjoyable thing. It wasn't something like, ooh, I can't wait to do that. Even when Jesus, the night before, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, the transfiguration, and he's like, God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but yours be done. This is going to be the worst thing that Jesus can ever imagine to go through. And he's like, no, I'm the man of sorrows. So I think there's some dangerous, super dangerous theologies out there. Like the idea of your best life now. The idea that God is just going to prosper you. He's only going to make you happy. And if that isn't true, then there's some sin in your life. Or, or something's not right. Like you just need it. Like that is terrible theology that will take you to a deep, deep, dark place that will leave you only with a couple options. Only with a couple options. Either God doesn't care like he says he cares or there's something wrong in your life that you messed up. You didn't believe enough or you have some sin in your life and so God is not answering your prayer. What a terrible place to leave Christians. If you give that advice to Habakkuk, he's going to laugh in your face. He's saying, I see the calamity that's coming for me for my people, and it makes my heart pound, my lips quiver, decay creeps into my bones, and my legs tremble. Yet I, I love that, right? Yet I, my circumstances, like I pled my case to God, I poured my heart out, my circumstances aren't changing. In fact, they got worse, yet I. His faith got to a place where he trusted God, said, God, it's not my timetable. It's not the way in which I want. Yet I wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. So do you know what that means? It means that, okay, God, like the first part, I wanted you to do something about it. You told me your plan. I'm, I didn't want you to do that plan because it doesn't seem fair that this unjust, even more evil nation is going to judge us. Yet I will wait patiently for you to bring judgment and judge that evil. Listen, I, I can't promise you in this life that God is going to judge your abuser and that he's going to make everything right here on earth. 
I can't promise you that in this life, that your marriage that broke up over the last year or two, that God's going to miraculously bring that back together. I cannot promise you that the cancer that your loved one or you have experienced this last year, uh, in recent years, that, that God's just going to come down here, let me pray for you, and God is going to bless you. He's going to take all that away. He can. He is able, and we can believe that, God, I know you're everlasting. I know you're sovereign. I know you're in control of all things. You have the power, yet I will wait for your justice. Yet I will wait patiently for your plan. Like, there's something I need to back up because somehow I do not see you at work here, and I want to believe that you're at work here, God. I want to believe you're at work. He gets to that place. Verse 17 he kind of walks through, like, worst-case scenario. He says, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and though there are no cattle stuck in the stalls. Stop right there. Oh, sorry, Matt. <laughs> he goes through his progression, right? So the fig tree does not bud. Figs are not essential. They're just kind of like a delicacy, right? Then he goes to, though there's no grapes on the vines. Well, now we... We can't, we won't have wine. We won't be able to mix that with our water even to make clean. We'll, we'll survive without that, but it's going to be very, very inconvenient. Our lives are going to be affected. It's not going to be as enjoyable. Though, there, though the olive crops fail, this would be very severe. Now they have no oil for cooking. They have no oil for their lamps. They'll be in complete darkness every single night. The fields produce no food. That would be grain. That would be barley. That would be wheat. And this is a staple for them. This means that, like, there's going to be famine in the land. They will have nothing to eat. People, large groups of people, will starve to death. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Sheep would have been mostly for clothing, uh, maybe a little bit of meat every now and then. They would not have eaten the, the cattle. Like, that, that's just not something. They don't know what they're missing like a good Iowa steak, right? Let's teach these. So like, but they, really cattle were a sign of wealth and cattle would have done all the heavy lifting. Basically, he goes in ascending uh, order of, okay, this is inconvenient, a little more inconvenient to total devastation, total economic disaster, starvation, famine, the complete. He says, even though all this happens, then verse 18, yet I, isn't that amazing? Yeah, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Stop on that verse just for a moment. It reminds me of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember that? And they're in the fiery furnace. And, and they're, they're like going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. And they say, we know that our God is able to deliver us. But even if he does not, we will not bow. There is a resilience that has developed in Habakkuk's faith from chapter one to chapter three that was not there when he started. There is this idea that regardless of the circumstances, regardless that I don't understand exactly how God is gonna be just, how he's gonna be loving, like there is a resilience to his faith that says I will trust God and regardless of what happens in my circumstances, like do your worst in this world, like yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Like, that's, that's a verb. I will choose to be joyful in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. He recognizes that this judgment, this punishment, is not because God is um, uh, he's, uh, so upset with Israel, he's just going to wipe them off the planet. He gives very clear instructions and all the other minor prophets that this is only going to last like 70 years, and he's going to bring them back. The whole book of Nehemiah, the whole book of Ezra is about that, that God restoring his people to the land. God has always made good on his covenant. His covenant people were not. And God's like, I need to get your attention so that you can be the covenant people that I need you to be. And it's just beautiful. He brings them back. Verse 19, the sovereign Lord is my strength. So it's interesting. I was studying the word sovereign Lord, and, and I can only find it in Psalms. This is the only place outside the Psalms that those two words, Yahweh and my Lord, are actually used together. Habakkuk uses the strongest two words that you can use for the, the idea of God to him. He's like, the sovereign Lord, it's actually my Lord. So the God who is in control of all things, my Lord, is my strength. So he's come to a place of surrender, like, even though I don't understand it, even though my circumstances, like, 
they're about to get really, really bad, the sovereign Lord, he is my Lord. He makes my feet like the feet of deer, which is, you know, we, there's a lot of deer hunting about to start happening in Iowa. But, but this picture is used because in a land that's full of places to stumble, in a land that's very rocky and mountainous, he uses this picture of my, my sure footing is because of God, my strength. Like, I feel like I'm about to stumble, and God is not going to let me stumble. He's actually going to take me to a higher place. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. And then he closes with this. For the director of the music on my stringed instruments. And that, that might seem like insignificant to you, right? Why is, he, why is that even in there? Here's why I think it's so incredible. Look around the room real quick. Like, just look around. Don't look at me. Look around the room. Stop looking at me. Look around the room. You guys aren't listening this morning. Sitting in the seats in this auditorium are people that have walked super hard paths. People that have lost loved ones. People that have had marriages dissolve. Cancer, accidents. They've been betrayed. They've been abandoned. They've been abused. And the ones that impress me so much are the ones that are able to, okay, God, I'm, I'm not saying this isn't painful. It's the most painful thing I've ever walked through. I'm trying so hard to believe that you're a good God. I'm trying to get my heart there. I don't understand why you're allowing this circumstance to happen. And I don't understand, like, your sense of justice. I feel far from you, honestly, at times. I feel like you're not listening. And I'm screaming out at your silence. I feel your silence, and it's deafening. And they allow us that have not walked those hard paths to enter into that, that hard path with them, to allow us to grieve with them, to allow us to sit with them, and to learn from their tragedy, their trauma, their disappointment, and, and then um, our faith is increased because of it. That's exactly what Habakkuk is doing here. Habakkuk is not saying, hey, this is my private struggle. I'm embarrassed to tell people. He, he writes up this amazing song that's meant for the director of music on my stringed instruments. Everything that Habakkuk has learned the hard way, not in an ivory tower, not in a vacuum, but in the hard knocks of life, he's saying, you guys got to know. Like I was ready to throw in the towel because I was really, really struggling to believe that God is good. And look, look what he actually is. Look, look who he is. We can trust him. Like, yet I, yet I with me. Listen, we are best as a church when we enter into the, the disappointments, the hurts, the tragedy, the trauma of life, and we just sit there and we learn and we're saying, okay, I, I saw this person go through the death of a child. I don't know how they did that, but I learned so much from them and I, like, it gives me hope to not give up and to not give in because I saw them walk through this. And so because they didn't give up and they didn't give in, like maybe, maybe I can learn from that and be strong. Like that is what the community of faith is all about. We are not a vacuum. We bear one another's burdens so that the burdens don't crush us. Because in our circumstance, when we're so close to the trauma, we're so close to the disappointment, so close to the pain, it's so easy for us to give up on God when we're questioning, when we're doubting. And that, that's really the beauty of this. So I, I told you I was going to bring this in the New Testament. So I'm going to do that really quickly for you as we close. A lot of times we think that these, okay, that's good for Habakkuk, but what about us? I think it's very important. If we see a principle in the Old Testament not repeated in the New Testament, we should have pause. But let, me sh let me show you what the New Testament says about this. This is from Mark chapter 9. And, uh, and there's a guy that comes to Jesus, and he has a son who's been demon-possessed his entire life. The kid's been throwing himself in fires. He's been trying to kill himself. It's a terrible, terrible story. And he comes to Jesus, and he's like, a little help. I've heard that you're who, like, you're this miracle worker. Could you do something? And Jesus has a conversation with him. Hey, you just need to believe. And this is what he says. Immediately, the boy's father's complaint, I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. And Jesus heals his son. It's, it's amazing. Jesus doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't turn him away like, hey, listen, you don't believe. It is possible. There is a version of our faith where we can cry out to God, as this man did in Mark 9, uh, cry out to Jesus and say, I believe, help me in my unbelief. 
because my circumstances hurt so much. I want to believe, but the circumstances are crushing my soul. People are coming around me, but God, I need you to help me in my unbelief. There's an honest doubting of God that I think God is a friend to you. Not every, some of, some of you are very cynical and you want to remain an unbeliever. And so we come up with all these ideas why God can't be real, why God can't be true. I, I don't think that's going to win the day for you. But when we as believers, and I'm going to say non-believers even, can say, okay, God, I want to believe. Help me in my unbelief. I think, there's, I think God has a friend to that person. So I just encourage you, like, don't be afraid. I, I think when we say, like, your best life now, like, what life are you living? <laughs> like, is, if this is the best that it gets, man, I don't want heaven. Heaven is no more tears, no more crying. Earth, we all will have disappointment and hurt. Help us, I believe, help us in our unbelief. Uh, 2 Corinthians, or sorry, James 1, 2. Consider pure joys, my brothers and my sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. The word many there is the word kaleidoscope. Verse three. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Listen, I think we all want a deep, and, and connected relationship with God. And, and I think that if we can do the spiritual discipline that this is talking about here, that when we have trials of kaleidoscope of colors, kaleidoscope of reasons, whatever that might be, when we can actually say, okay, I'm gonna do the work here and I'm not gonna drink myself to sleep every night. I'm not gonna allow bitterness and hatred for that person, unforgiveness to rule in my heart. I'm somehow going to have joy like Habakkuk did. Somehow consider it joy, which is something I choose, so that maturity can happen in my faith. Like This would say that whatever kaleidoscope of trial you are experiencing here today, if you enter in and let God do the hard work in your life, it can produce maturity and perseverance in a way that you just don't have without that. So I think that's an amazing truth for you and I. Second Corinthians chapter five, seven says, for we live by faith and not by sight. That's, uh, it actually comes from um, Habakkuk 2, 4. It says the righteous shall live by faith or faithfulness. And it repeats that in Second Corinthians 5, 7. So what is faith? Well, we, we just did a study in Hebrews not that long ago. Hebrews 11, 1 says this. Now faith is a confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Listen, faith is something that, that's described in this chapter. It lists, I don't know how many times, I think there's like 28 by faith, by faith, by faith. All these people that said they did not see the promise come true, and so they believed. So our faith is hope. Our faith is not our circumstance. Our faith does not mean everything's going really good for me. My faith is really, really strong. Our faith says, regardless of the circumstance, I have a faith that has a hope in something that is in the horizon, that, that God one day will make it right for us. Later on in this chapter, it says all these people, again, the 28, maybe there's more than that, I can't remember. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Admitting that there were foreigners and strangers on earth. And that, that's for you and I. That whatever trouble, whatever uh, turmoil we're going through, this is not our home. That one day, the promise that we have through Jesus is that he will wipe away every tear. But it might not happen for you here on earth. He, it might. But is your faith resilient enough? Can you do the spiritual list, discipline of listing out the ways uh, that God is good, the promises that he will come through on, that we welcome from a distance on a horizon that, okay, that's enough, that's enough. Verse 16 said, instead they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to, call, to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. All right, here's what we're gonna do. The band's gonna come and we're gonna close our time here together. Thanks, there's a lot there I know. But there, there is a truth that you and I can claim, regardless of the circumstances, I don't think that you are promised that your circumstances are gonna get better here today. I, I hope that's true. I know that God can do that, but I don't think he owes us that. I don't think he has absolutely promised us that. Don't get me wrong, I, th I think he can, I think he does a lot, and we should like write those down, thank you God, because this could go a lot of different ways. Even if he does not, 
yet I. Like, can we develop a resilience in our faith where we can say, in spite of the circumstances, even if it gets way, way worse, yet I will worship you, God. I will find my joy in you. Would you stand with me? And let's sing about this person. The promise that we have in Jesus is this. Romans 8 says it this way. That I believe that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a promise for you and I. We're not Israel. The promise that, that we can claim, every single believer here today, is that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, right? So what that, and then it goes on to list all these things that neither height nor depth, nor angel nor demon, nor nakedness nor famine. And then it says, not even death itself. Do your worst in this life, like whatever the world has for you, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's sing about that.